Hello again everybody, uh, this is going to be the uh, second bit of discussion about intramolecular forces. In the previous video you hopefully have already watched, uh, we covered dipole-dipole forces and hydrogen bonding. And so now we're going to take a look at the third force of uh, London dispersion, or just put more generally, the dispersion force. We'll start by taking a look at this chart here, and what you'll notice is there are kind of two different regions to this chart. First, the chart has boiling point versus period. So when we talk about period, we're talking about um, the period, the location on the periodic table of the central atom in these molecules like carbon there, nitrogen there, um, iodide over there. Okay, so the central atom in, uh, in these different compounds. And so the chart kind of has two different regions. Um, one region is the stuff associated with period two you see that some of the boiling points like water and HF and ammonia are pretty high. And then there's a second region to the chart where the data trends somewhat linearly as we go from say on the green line pH3 and ASH3 and SBH3 or even the, uh, the blue line there at the bottom from methane all the way up to stanane, tin, H4. So what we're going to do is try to explain the two different areas of this chart. So the first thing we probably want to take a look at is maybe the anomalies. And I'm referring to the stuff that's out here um, with the higher boiling points. Let's back up for a quick second. What happens when something boils? Think to yourself in terms of intermolecular forces. What happens when something boils? Well, in the liquid or solid phase, but let's talk about the liquid here since we're talking about boiling, molecules or atoms have intramolecular forces. They, they have a tendency to want to adhere to one another. But in the gas phase, they do not. At least according to the uh, kinetic molecular theory, we assume there are no attractive forces between molecules. So, simply put, when something is boiling, when something reaches its boiling point, essentially what happens is it is overcoming the intramolecular forces. The IMFs effectively go away when you go from the liquid to the gas phase. So then, back to this set of anomalies, water, HF, and ammonia up here. Why are their boiling points so high? Well, if you think about what we were just talking about, materials with high boiling points must be materials that have, relatively speaking, strong intramolecular forces. The molecules want to stick to each other in the liquid phase, and they don't want to leave each other. They don't want to be separated from one another and go into the gas phase. So molecules like water and HF and ammonia they have relatively strong intramolecular forces as liquids. What IMF do they have in particular? Well, think about H2O, HF, and NH3. Well, those are the three suspects that we talked about when we talked about hydrogen bonding. So the molecules up here all possess a fair amount of hydrogen bonding. And hydrogen bonding is a special and strong case of dipole-dipole force. Okay, what about the rest of the chart? And to think about the rest of the chart, actually, I want to take a closer look at the uh, bluish-green line there on the bottom because that kind of displays the trend for the rest of the chart pretty clearly. Well, it starts down there with methane, CH4, and carbon is not electronegative enough to really do any hydrogen bonding. It's not nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. But we can see as we go from methane to silane, SiH4, to germane, GeH4, to stanane, TinH4, SnH4, along that blue-green line, we clearly see a change in the boiling points. We're going from, what might that be, about negative 180 for methane to, um, oh, maybe about uh, negative 75-ish for uh, stanane, TinH4. So these molecules, they don't do hydrogen bonding, and they're certainly not also doing dipole-dipole forces because methane, CH4, as you might recall, has a tetrahedral structure. And so molecules that have tetrahedral structures that are fully symmetric don't have the right geometry to engage in dipole-dipole forces. There's no net dipole within that molecule. There's no partially positive or partially negative end throughout that molecule. So all of those molecules on the blue-green line cannot do dipole-dipole interactions. So no hydrogen bonding, no dipole-dipole, yet we clearly see a change of maybe nearly 100 degrees in their boiling points as the molecules go from left to right there. 
So that must mean there's another force at play. That other force is going to be the London Dispersion Force, LDF. Look and talk in more detail about LDF. What is LDF, the London Dispersion Force, or just Dispersion Force? Well, it turns out that LDF is, is kind of a ubiquitous force amongst molecules. It's always there, because all you need to have LDF is you need to have a positive nucleus, and you need to have negative electrons. Put another way, every single thing has LDF. All molecules will demonstrate LDF. The question is, is LDF a really important force relative to the intermolecular interactions? Or is it pretty much just there, but kind of insignificant? It turns out that LDF interactions can range from uh, uh, just a few tenths or a few hundredths kilojoules per mole, or it can go all the way up to something like 40 kilojoules per mole. Why such a huge range? Well, because molecules have different numbers of positively charged nuclei and different numbers of electrons surrounding them. The more positive nuclei you have, the more electrons you have, the greater this LDF force is going to be. Or to put it kind of in a more simple sense, as the molar mass gets bigger, the LDF is going to get bigger. Because that's going to mean that you're going to have more and more positive nuclei trying to interact with more and more negative electrons between the molecules. Let's see how this force actually works. When we introduced intramolecular forces in the previous video, I tried to get across the idea that um, all of these forces, dipole-dipole, hydrogen bonding, and LDF, really are just variations on the dipole-dipole theme. And when I think of LDF, I think one of the best ways to think about it is to think about it as an atomic-sized dipole, sort of a very tiny, tiny, tiny little dipole. Let's take a look at how this might work. So here on the right, let's start on the right. What I'm showing here is just sort of a um, kind of a, a cartoon-ish version of an atom. So please forgive the lack of S orbitals and P orbitals and all of that detail. So we just have here a positive nucleus surrounded by negative electrons shown as these tiny little blue uh, circles. So as the electrons travel around a nucleus, Remember, the electron distribution is sort of probabilistic, right? The electrons are going to be probably here and probably there within their sp and d orbitals, etc. And as the electrons sort of circulate the nucleus, at some point, there's going to be an uneven distribution of that electron density, of that electron cloud, to the point where within one atom, we could have more electrons on one side of the atom than on the other. In this case, I'm showing more electrons on the right-hand side of the nucleus. Again, these are spherical, so, you know, be a little bit generous here when I say right. Um, on the right-hand side of the atom than on the left. What that's going to do is that's going to induce a tiny little dipole that looks something like that within the atom. A delta minus on the right because of the extra electrons, and a delta plus on the left because of the lack of electrons. And so uh, we can draw that tiny little dipole. Here's another notation for dipoles. You draw an arrow that points towards the negative end of the dipole with a little plus tail. So that dipole and that atom, what it's going to do is it's going to create a dipole in neighboring atoms. So on the left-hand side, we have the electrons beginning to get unevenly distributed, distributed there. So we have another tiny little atomic-sized dipole. And you can imagine that atom after atom, this is going to start to happen, till eventually the whole molecule has a very temporary, uh, I think our book uses the word um, instantaneous or induced dipole throughout the whole molecule. That causes a dipole to be created within neighboring molecules. Now, of course, all of this is happening at faster than the snap of your fingers, given how quickly electrons can uh, redistribute themselves. But this helps account for, then, why molecules that aren't polar, molecules that can't engage in hydrogen bonding, why molecules like methane, CH4, can still actually demonstrate some affinity for each other. Now, it's really hard to liquefy methane. It's really hard to condense it. So this LDF force, in the case of something like methane, isn't really strong because there aren't a lot of positively charged nuclei and there's not a lot of electrons.
but as we get to larger molecules, if you think about things like polymers, which are sort of repeating units of a particular um, building block, and we start to build up lots of nuclei with lots of electrons surrounding them, the LDF, as the molecules get bigger, can be really important. Okay, so let's kind of uh, put all of this together. We have our three forces enlisted in approximate order of increasing strength, we have LDF. Typically the weakest, but as I write here, it certainly can dominate for larger molecules. The dipole-dipole force, well, we need to have polar molecules, right? We need to have a partially positive and a partially negative end of the molecule. And this is where electronegativity differences are going to come into play. The other thing we should mention about dipole-dipole forces is you have to make sure you have the right geometry. If you have sort of a um, spherical or, or very symmetric molecule, then that molecule isn't going to have a net dipole. It could essentially be canceled out. The best example to think of would be something like carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide has two dipoles, one pointing that way and another pointing that way. But the net result is a tug of war where there is no net dipole. So CO2 even though it has dipoles within the molecule, is not itself overall polar. So something like CO2, because of its geometry, would not display dipole-dipole force. It would only display LDF. And then lastly, we have hydrogen bonding. Again, a specialized case of dipole-dipole force. You need to have a hydrogen atom that is bonded to nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, and that sets up your partially positive, partially negative dipole, which can interact with a neighboring molecule. And again, um, all things being equal, when you're talking about comparing molecules of comparable size, uh, hydrogen bonding is going to be typically the strongest. Okay, so there's all the intramolecular forces. Where can we see the evidence, where can we see their impact? We have to talk about a few different uh, sorts of physical properties or uh, macroscopic properties, things you and I can see um, with the naked eye or with maybe some fairly simple um, instrumentation. For example, we have boiling point. And we already talked about this, but as the intermolecular forces increases, the ability of the molecules to adhere to one another within the liquid phase is going to become stronger and stronger. So their boiling point increases. As intermolecular forces increase, vapor pressure is going to decrease. Now what's vapor pressure? Vapor pressure is the tendency of a liquid to evaporate. And so as that liquid contains molecules that want to stick to each other more and more, the tendency of that liquid to evaporate is going to go down and down, so the vapor pressure goes down. Surface tension. Kind of the nerd's definition of surface tension is a uh, liquid's resistance to uh, increase its surface area. So you can think about this at the molecular level. If the molecules like each other, they want to stick to each other, then they're not going to want to spread out as much. Okay? Think about a drop of water on top of a freshly waxed car. Right? The water beads up because the water is trying to stick to itself. Okay? And then we have viscosity which is a resistance to flow. Again, if we have a liquid comprised of molecules that like to stick to each other, then that liquid isn't going to flow very easily. You can think of motor oil here, right? Motor oils talk about their viscosity, and the, the heavier the oil molecules are, the more viscous the liquid's going to be, and the less likely it's going to flow. And then we have capillary action. I don't want to spend too much time on this because it's sort of a kind of a, um, a, a small um, uh, example of a liquid property. But capillary action, as you might recall, is what happens when we take a, a thin tube, and I'm exaggerating the size here, stick it in a liquid, the squiggly line is the universal sign for a liquid, and some of that liquid shoots up inside the tube. The result after it shoots up is you can get two different kinds of meniscuses or menisci, whatever the plural might be. You can get a meniscus that is sort of a happy face meniscus, or when you stick a tube into liquid, you could get a frowny face meniscus. And the difference really depends upon the intermolecular forces within the liquid versus the tendency of the liquid to want to stick to the surface of the tube that you stuck inside the liquid. If the liquid molecules like themselves 
more than they like the surface of the tube that you stuck in, then what you're going to end up getting is a meniscus that looks something like the one I drew on the right, where the IMFs within the liquid are stronger than the ability of the liquid to adhere to the surface of the tube. Whereas on the left-hand side, we're looking at a meniscus where the liquid wants to try to touch as much of the tube that you put into the liquid as possible. This is probably the more common meniscus we see, right, if you stick uh, a glass tube into water, you see that smiley face meniscus. That's because water really likes the surface of glass. Glass is a very polar substance on its surface. Water being a polar molecule really wants to try to touch as much of the surface of the glass as possible. All right, so that's capillary action and a handful of other uh, properties of liquids um, that we can understand their trends by thinking about the systems at the molecular level. And so uh, what you're going to be doing on uh, the first couple of slams and throughout this unit is thinking about uh, molecules at the molecular level and thinking about the types of IMFs they might be displaying and how those IMFs will impact upon trends that we can observe, like we saw in that first chart in this video, trends in boiling points and vapor pressures and things like that. All right, that'll do it. That's intermolecular forces.